Hello, this is Jyoti Marcel. Today we shall discuss Franz Kafka's The Trial. So let's start with Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka was born on 1883 in Prague, Austria Hungary, which is now Czech Republic. He had a few affairs and failures in love. Uh, now this is important because uh, these affairs uh, had uh, a sort of shadow in his works. So he had affair with Felix Bauer, Milena Polak, and more significantly Dora Diamant, a young Jewish socialist. Let me tell you that Franz Kafka was himself a Jewish and he was born in a Jewish family. Now with Dora Diamant, he lived in Berlin until his death. Uh, that was because of tuberculosis. In 1924, a very few works were published uh, in his lifetime, and in his deathbed, he asked his friend Max Frost to burn all the manuscripts after his death. But instead, Max Frost published those. These are his important works: *Metamorphosis*, *The Trial*, *The Judgment*, *The Castle*, *Contemplation*, *A Hunger Artist*. Later to Felix. Let's read the very first line of the story, the metamorphosis. As Gregor Sansa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into an enormous insect. Now you see the very element of shock and absurdity and illogical aspect in the very first line that Gregor Sansa, a crack character, who woke up one day, uh, one day and found himself transformed into a vermin. You can find this sort of absurdity, uh, some sort of surreal quality in most of his works. Now, there is a term that we generally re relate this sort of writing that was propounded by Kafka, that is Kafka's. And what is Kafka's? A Kafka's writing are those writing having a nightmarishly complex, bizarre or illogical quality. Now Kafka's literature are those texts which are surreal and sometimes vividly uh, expressing the anxiety, alienation and significantly the powerlessness of the individual in the 20th century. Now you can evidently see in all of his works almost, you can find a sort of nightmarish quality. So, the word Kafkaesque is often applied to bizarre and impersonal administrative situations where the individual feels powerless to understand or control what is happening. So, just uh, let's just move into the trial, the text. Let's see the premise of the trial. Now this trial is a story that is telling you about the arrest of Joseph K. Now the situation is like that, that an ambitious worldly young bank officer, official named Joseph K is arrested by two warders one fine morning. It is just that he awoke one, one morning and uh, and one man knocked into the door and told him that uh, I am here to arrest you without no reason. So this morning happens to be his 30th birthday. One year later, on the morning of his 31st birthday, two warders again come for K and they take him to a ferry outside the town and kill him in the name of the law. And they just left them. So you see, the story is the very aspect, the crux of the story is something that is illogical. That one fine morning, uh, two men came to arrest someone and they didn't explain anything. And they just said that it is in the name of law and they are quite compelled to arrest him. And they couldn't give him any sort of explanation. But you see that this text uh, does have multiple layers of meaning. So 
let's look into the plot in a bit details so evidently the things are absurdity and uh, surrealism and obviously alienation now what is absurdity the absurdity is the meaninglessness of the world and man's constant effort to find meaning within it that is absurdity surrealism what is surrealism surrealism is just juxtaposition of incongruous images in order to include unconscious and dream elements it's something like a juxtaposition of unconscious mind and the uh, conscious perception that is reality so it's a sort of dreamy effect it would create a sort of dreamy effect that semi real something now what is alienation alienation is something that is uh, uh, that the tale would, uh, that this story would tell you it's about the man's position man's soul alone position in the world which is governed by law and order so basically this novel would tell you about the law and order and the powerlessness of an individual in the modern world chapter 1 One morning, landlady's cook doesn't bring his breakfast. Instead, an unknown man knocks and steps into his bedroom. Another waits in the next room. Now these men are here to arrest Joseph K, and they didn't give any explanation. That mere just asks to do so. He thinks that this is a sort of prank because. It's his thirtieth birthday, and perhaps the prank is played by uh, his uh, his uh, colleagues. The warders make him change into a black suit and walk him into an adjoining room. The room has recently rented to Pauline Brosner, a typist. Now there, the inspector waits, and who says that? K is free to go about his business for the time being. Then they depart. So you see that suddenly one morning two men came to arrest him, and other men are other police officers are waiting in the next room, and they are here to arrest him, and they are telling you that you can go wherever you like, but you see that you are under the control of law, and we are here to arrest you for the time being. You can. Uh, you can go wherever you want. You are free for the time being. So you see, uh, in the very opposite building, one old man and one old woman are constantly uh, peeping into uh, this apartment where Joseph K lives. So he is gaining attention. It's a sort of panopticon that he is being watched. By other people, so he goes to the bank, uh, and uh, he goes to the uh, he goes to the beer hall and visits Elsa. So this incident that happened in the morning, uh, he feels quite odd about it, as if something uh, something it's a sort of nightmare that happened in his life. In the evening. Uh, Joseph K goes to Frau Grubert, the household owner, and Frau Grubert says that she is not agitated at all for the, the incidents that happened uh, in the morning. In the meantime, Frau Lindbergner returns, and it turns out that he has a sort of affair with her. Chapter two. A phone call informs Joseph K that a brief inquiry is on Sunday. He is given the address where he is to go, but not the time. So you see, that is also odd, because Sunday is generally off day, a holiday, and he has to go to a court, uh, and he has been provided with the address, but not the time. So K sets out on Sunday on foot. He didn't. Uh, he doesn't take a taxi because he doesn't want anyone to know about 
uh, the fact that he is going to a court. Now he goes to the address and finds that it's a gigantic building and there are multiple stairways. So he has to choose one stairway and uh, he chooses a stairway and ascends and look into from room to room. Now you see he doesn't want anyone to know that he is looking for the courtroom and uh, that's why he uh, opens every door where the people are living in and asks for someone named uh, lambs. Now this you see this is also all. A courtroom is somewhere uh, in, a, in a large building where other people live. Now this is something that is quite surreal. It's like being, it's like nightmare. That you need to find the court. You need to find the courtroom in a gigantic building with multiple stairways, where uh, there are multiple rooms, where multiple people live. So you see, something is odd about it. So on the fifth floor, a woman washing children's clothes tells him to enter and go through another door. Now this is also odd. In the fifth floor, he finds that a woman is washing clothes, and she is telling him that go through that door, you can find the courtroom. Now he opens the door and finds that a large number of audiences are there, and uh, he is being led by a boy to the hall. Now examining many a magistrate. Rebuke him for being over an hour late. Now it is now past 10 a.m. Remember that he was not provided with the time. So he had to assume that he would appear somewhere uh, in a courtroom in the office time. So he guessed it totally. So the law is rebuking him, which is not his mistake. When he replies that he is here now, and half of the crowd bursts into applause. Significantly, the other half of the crowd remains totally silent. So half of the crowd is apparently supporting this Joseph Kay and other half is not. Just like a true group. He sets out to win over the entire audience with his tirades. He seizes magistrate's notebook and pulls it up with disdain. He gives a long speech describing his arrest. A disturbance amidst the audience is being found there. So the trial is being uh, disturbed by some incident. When he is about to leave, the magistrate says to him that uh, I merely wanted to point out that today you have flung away with your own hand all the advantages which an interrogation invariably confers on an innocent man. So this magistrate is telling him that he is innocent but he is uh, here because of some crime which he didn't commit. So it's ironical but law wants him to get elected that's the important fact. Now chapter 3, he returns to the address on the next morning, next Sunday morning. Now the same young woman opens the door, the same washer woman. But, he, but she informs that uh, there is no sitting today. Now that is also odd. Now on one Sunday there is a proceeding and on the next Sunday there is none. He learns that the young woman and her husband live in the room without charge in exchange of the labor. And the disturbance that happened in the last week that was caused by a certain law student who is after her. She is clearly attracted to him and offers to help him. Perhaps she can sway the examining uh, magistrate in some way since the man has recently begun to notice her. Then the bandy legged, uh, scraggy bearded law student enters the courtroom and lifts up the omen 
and begins to carry her off. She says the magistrate has sent for her and she is obviously not in much distress. Then uh, after that the woman's husband comes and uh, the man complains to K about his wife and the lost hood. They climb to the stairs and enter a long narrow lobby where various accused men wait. Now this is also surreal and quite uh, nightmarish because you see there is a large lobby, there is a long lobby where various accused men of various ages, they are waiting as if for eternity for the courtroom to open. So there is no escape apparently from the law and you need to wait and wait and wait. Chapter 4, chapter 4 is not that very important because chapter 4 uh, is uh, centered on prowling business avoidance after she uh, comes to know of this trial. Now she is intentionally avoiding this Joseph K. Apparently thinking that uh, he has definitely committed some crime. Chapter 5 when uh, Joseph K was uh, is returning from his office, then he hears a sort of noise coming from the backyard. Now he inspects the room, and in one room, he finds that uh, two words are being whipped. Now two words are being whipped. Now these two words are those two men who came to. Joseph K's room to arrest him. In the very first chapter, you can remember that. Now, why they are being whipped? Because Joseph K has complained about their misbehavior or their misdemeanor. So that's why they are being whipped. And the whipper tells him that his task is only to whip them. And when Joseph K offers him uh, money, the Weeper refuses that and says that uh, he doesn't enjoy this task, but it is his task to whip them. So he is just doing his job. So you see, even those two borders are not beyond the law. And this is also odd that in a room just beside the bank where uh, Joseph K works, uh, these two men are being whipped. So you see, these courtrooms and the law. Uh, and the rooms that uh, deal with law are apparently uh, in every contour or of every apartment. It's in a building, it's in the office, it's everywhere apparently. Chapter 6 Joseph K's country dwelling uncle, Carl, comes to see him. The uncle has caught wind of the case and is very concerned both for K and for family's sake. And he is quite upset about the fact that K has jeopardized the prospect of proving himself innocent by avoiding the orders of law. Uncle Carl prevails upon K to accompany him to uh, visit an old lawyer friend. This lawyer friend turns out to be Herr Hood, who is very sick and is on uh, his sick bed when they call. You see, there, there is a nurse also who is uh, hearing this Herr Hood. The chief clerk of the court is also in the room, waiting in the shadows. He has come to pay the lawyer a visit. Now a loud sound of breaking a cookery comes from the entrance hall. He volunteers to see what has happened. It turns out that it is Lenny, the lawyer's nurse. Remember the lawyer's nurse is Lenny. Apparently burning with desire for him. He's co uh, sorry, she caused the commotion to bring him out of the room. She leads him into the lawyer's study. In the lawyer's study, there is a large portrait of a man 
of an old man wearing a George's robe. Lenny says that she knows him. He is only an examining magistrate. Chapter 7 Now K is incapable of concentrating on his work quite naturally. Now one manufacturer who comes to K's office says that he has learned about K's case from a painter whose name is Titorelli. Now he offers him to go to this Titorelli because he might know something. Something, uh, something important about this case. Now, Joseph K. This is the painter. Now, painter uh, lives in a very poor, uh, very poor, easy cottage type of uh, structure, and uh, where you see the passage leading to this uh, Titorelli's room, Titorelli's studio, uh, is 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 very is is very. You see, nicely, it's surreal. The painter lives in a section of the city even poorer than one K visited for his interrogation. K finds the building, climbs stairs, runs a gauntlet of nosy teenage girls, and meets the painter in the latter's tiny studio room. So, little girls are also peeping into uh, this Titorelli studio and constantly disturbing their conversation. The girls remain outside the door, peeping and listening. Titorelli offers to use his connection to aid Kay's case. He describes the three possible acquittal that may be hoped for. This is very significant. This is very important. That he tells of three possible acquittal. Now, what are the three possible acquittals? The first one is definite acquittal. And the second was this ostensible acquittal, and the third one is indefinite postponement. Now, what is definite acquittal? That is something that K would, uh, K could uh, prove himself to be innocent, and he would be free. Now, Titorelli is saying that this is something that he uh, has not seen in years, and this is something achieved by the legends. So, this is something a hope which is beyond the grasp. And what is the uh, ostensible acquittal? That this is something that apparently there uh, there are possibilities that a few files can be uh, can be ready to prove he is innocent. But again, the law can arrest him once again at any time uh, uh, regarding this case by proving some sort of loopholes. Now, what he suggests he suggests indefinite postponement that is something that the case would be deferred and deferred and deferred uh, and this is something that is a way that he could be free so that means some constant attachment to the court and constant activities so basically this is something that you are just deferring the process for an indefinite time the painter induces the Desperate K to buy several identical landscapes. Okay. The nosy girls are still outside the door. The painter lets K out through another door in the tiny room. This leads to a hallway that looks identical to the lobby of the court, uh, law offices. Now you see that room. Uh, there is a passage that would K that would take K out of this. Uh, apartment type of thing or some alley sort of thing then uh, he finds that he instead comes into the uh, building which is identical to the courtrooms which is identical to the building that he encountered uh, in the third chapter now this is something that is uh, quite odd because you see at this point of time that is quite apparent that uh, law rooms and the law is everywhere that the painter informs kings uh, actually the painter informs K that there are law court offices in every attic it's everywhere it's in every contour of every building it can be anywhere and anytime 
So chapter 8. K resolves to dispense with Lloyd's services. It's almost a year. And uh, he's not satisfied with the service of Herr Hull. So he goes to the lawyer's house uh, one evening past 10 o'clock. The door is opened by somewhat equitable figure. And he sees that Lenny is uh, running away wearing a very short, uh, short dress. The lawyer informs K of a peculiarity of Lenny's character that he finds all accused men extraordinarily attractive. So this pitiable figure is someone who is also accused of some crime, some unknown crime that he doesn't know and Lenny finds him to be attractive. Herhold claims he would continue with his current activities. He is not interested anymore. He is puzzled. The lawyer humiliates the tradesman to show uh, K that he has he had been treated well. Uh, actually, uh, this Herhold, someone says, uh, man, this old man, and humiliates him in front of Joseph K to show him that. He has been actually behaving well with this uh, Joseph K. So, chapter 9. Uh, in chapter 9, we see that an influential Italian client is coming to town and K has been charged with escorting the man to the city's cultural points of interest. K arrives at the office early and exhausted from having studied Italian drama the night before. He proposes that uh, K meet him at the cathedral at 10 o'clock. Okay, so he appears there in time, he arrives there in time, he goes to the cathedral and waits, but this man never comes. When he is about to leave, a voice behind him calls out Joseph K. Uh, he hears a voice suddenly Joseph K. and uh, he sees that it's a priest. The priest is in fact the prison chaplain connected to the court. Now this priest apparently knows everything about K's case and he tells him uh, Joseph K. a parable to make him understand the nature of law, a parable, and that is very important, that is called the parable of law in the text. Now, what is the parable of law? This tale tells of a man from the country who tries to gain admittance at an entrance to the law and is always denied by the doorkeeper. And yet, he learns that as he dies, that this entrance was meant only for him. Now that's the parable of law. A countryman comes to the court, but the doorkeeper never lets him in. And when he is about to die, he learns that this room, this this, this uh, entrance was made only for him. So that is the thing. This was made for him, but he was denied to enter. That's the parable of, parable of law. That is the irony of law. That is the wantonness of law, what you can say. Or obviously, that is the puzzle of law, importantly. The chaplain reminds K that he is connected to the court and that court wants nothing from you. It receives when you come and dismisses you when you go. So, this chaplain has nothing to do with K's case and he doesn't have any sort of personal grudge. Or even the law doesn't have any sort of personal grudge. What is the task of law? It will accept you when you come, and it will receive you when you come, and it will dismiss you when you go. So, the law is something that is very puzzling, that is very perplexing, that is wanton, that is something, uh, a power which can do whatever it, uh, it likes, and it can do whatever it will. Uh, think of you. So, chapter 10, the last chapter. On Joseph K's 31st birthday, two men in coats and top hats come for him 
and grab him. They walk out of the town to a deserted quarry situated near an urban looking house. One man removes a butcher's knife from his coat. Now that is obvious that they are going to kill him. Now Joseph K asks them to let him do this himself, but they didn't agree. They, they don't agree. Now at a distance, he sees that a man, uh, a figure, a figure is waving hands, and K makes his last gesture and waves the hand to the figure in the window, and then. One warder holds K while the other stabs him in the heart. He sees them watching him and makes a dying exclamation like a dog. So in the end Joseph K dies like a dog. So you see that story we can find uh, illogical elements in it, the surreal quality and obviously the nightmarish aspect of this text that one day, two men came to arrest Joseph K and they didn't explain anything. Now for the one year, Joseph K uh, has been very much disturbed and in the very 31st birthday, on the very 30, uh, 31st birthday of his uh, life, two men came and then killed him for no reason. So the law is something that is and uh, law is a supreme authority it will do whatever it will want it is something that is we can find the helplessness of the man in the modern society in face of law in face of the wanton mighty law so as you can uh, assume that all the screenshots are taken from Orson Welles 1962 adaptation of the trial I would recommend you to watch that movie that's a very really faithful adaptation of the text now these are the references thank you very much